Mrs. Wiggs of the Cabbage Patch, Chapter 3, The Christmas Lady The rosy glow of summer is on thy dimpled cheek, while in thy heart the winter is lying cold and bleak. But this shall change hereafter, when years have done their part, and on thy cheek the winter and summer in thy heart. Late the next afternoon, a man and a girl were standing in the Olcott reception hall, the lamps had not been lighted, but the blaze from the back log grew a cozy glow of comfort over the crimson curtains and on the mass of bright-hued pillows in the window seat. Robert Redding, standing with his hat in his hand, would have been gone long ago if the Christmas lady had not worn her violet gown. He said it always took him half an hour to say goodbye when she wore a rose in her hair and a full hour when she had on the violet dress. By Jove, stand there a minute just as you are. The firelight shining through your hair makes you look like a saint. Little Saint Lucinda, he said teasingly, as he tried to catch her hand, and she put it behind her for safekeeping. Not a saint at all, he went on in mock surprise. Then an iceberg, a nice proper little iceberg, Lucy Alcott looked up at him for a moment in silence. He was very tall and straight, and his face retained much of his boyishness in spite of the firm square jaw. Robert, she said suddenly, grown serious, I wish you would do something for me. All right, what is it? he asked. She timidly put her hand on his and looked up at him earnestly. It's about Dick Harris, she said. I wish you would not be with him so much. Redding's face clouded. You aren't afraid to trust me? he asked. Oh, no, it isn't that, she said hurriedly. But, Robert, it makes people think such wrong things about you. I can't bear to have you misjudged. Redding put his arm round her, and together they stood looking down into the growing embers. Tell me about it, little girl. What have you heard? he asked. She hesitated. It wasn't true what they said. I know it wasn't true, but they had no right to say it. Well, let's hear it anyway. What is it? Some people were here last night from New Orleans, and they asked if I knew you. And they knew you and Dick, the year you spent there. Well, asked Reddy. Lucy evidently found it difficult to continue. They said such horrid things. Then... "'Just because you were Dick's friend.' "'What were they, Lucy?' "'They told me that you were both as wild as could be "'and that your reputation was no better than his. "'That, forgive me, Robert, for even repeating it, "'it made me very angry, "'and I told them it was not true, not a word of it. "'That it was all Dick's fault, that he... "'Lucy,' interrupted Redding, Wait until you hear me. I have never lied to you about anything, and I will not stoop to it now. Four years ago, when those people knew me, I was just what they said. Dick Harris and I went to New Orleans straight from college. Neither of us had a home or people to care about us. So we went in for a good time. At the end of the year, I was sick of it all, braced up, and came here. Poor Dick, he kept on. At this first word, the color had left Lucy's face, and she had slipped to the opposite side of the fire. She stood watching him with horrified eyes. "'But you were never like Dick,' she protested. "'Yes,' he continued passionately, "'and but for God's help, I should be like him still. It was an awful pull, and heaven only knows how I struggled. I never quite saw the use of it all. "'until I met you six months ago, "'and then I realized the past four years "'had been given me in which to make a man of myself.' "'As he finished speaking, he saw for the first time "'that Lucy was crying. "'He sprang forward, but she shrank away. "'No, no, don't touch me. "'I'm so terribly disappointed and hurt and stunned. "'But you surely don't love me the less "'for having conquered these things in the past.' I don't know, I, I don't know, she said with a sob. I honored and idolized you, Robert. I can never think of you as being other than you are now. 
but why should you? He pleaded. It was only one year out of my life. Too much, it's true, but I have atoned for it with all my might. The intensity and earnestness of his voice were beginning to influence her. She was very young with the stern, uncompromising standards of girlhood. Life was black or white to her, and time had not filled in the canvas with the myriad grays that blend into one another until all lines are effaced and only the master artist knows the boundaries. She looked up through her tears. I'll try to forgive you, she said tremulously, but you must promise to give up your friendship with Dick Harris. Redding frowned and bit his lip. That's not fair, he said. You know Dick's my chum, that he hasn't the least influence over me, and I am about the only one to stand by him. I am not afraid of his influence, but I don't want people to see you together. It makes them say things. But Lucy, you wouldn't have me go back on him. Dick has a big heart, and he's trying to brace up. Oh, nonsense, cried Lucy impatiently. The fire in her eyes had dried the tears. He could straighten up if he wanted to. He likes to drink and gamble, so he does it. You only encourage him by your friendship. Are you choosing between us? She demanded ang angrily. Redding's face was clouded, and he spoke slowly. You wouldn't ask this of me, Lucy, if you understood. Dick and I have been chums since we were boys. He came to Kentucky three months ago, sick and miserable. One day he came into the office and said, Bob, you've pulled through all right. Do you think it's too late for me to try? What would you have me say? What you did, probably, answered Lucy. But I would have profited by the one experience, for he has hardly drawn a sober breath since. She looked out of the window across the snowy landscape, and her face was something of the passionless purity of the scene upon which her eyes rested. "'You are mistaken,' he cried fiercely, "'because you have seen him several times in this condition. You have no right to draw such a conclusion. He's weak. Nobody denies it. But what can you know of the struggle he makes, of his eagerness to do better, of the fight that he is continually making with himself?' His words fell on deaf ears. Then you choose Mr. Harris? Lucy, this is madness. It is not like you in the least. The girl was cold with anger and excitement. It is bad enough, she said. You know that my defense of you last night was worse than useless. But to have you persist in a friendship with a man who is beneath you in every way is more than I can stand. She slipped a ring from her finger and held it toward him. I could never marry a man of whom I am ashamed. The shot went home. There was a little white line about Redding's mouth as he turned away. I would not ask you to, he said with simple dignity as he opened the door. Please, ma'am. Is this Miss Alcott's? asked a trembling voice on the piazza. A shabby woman stood looking at them with wild eyes. Her gray hair had escaped from the torn shawl that was pinned over her head, and stray locks blew across her face. Lucy did not recognize her. I will speak to you in a moment, she said. An awkward pause followed, each waiting for the other to speak. I will come when you send for me, said Redding, without looking at her. And turning abruptly, he strode down the steps and out into the dusk. Lucy caught a breath and stared forward. Then she remembered the woman. What is it? she asked listlessly. The woman stepped forward and put out a hand to steady herself against the door. Her face was distorted and her voice came in gasps. You said I was to come if I needed you. It's, it's Jimmy, ma'am. He's dead. It may be experience of suffering makes one especially tender to the heartaches of others. At any rate, the article that Lucy Olcott wrote for the paper that night held the one touch of nature that makes the whole world kin. She had taken Aunt Chloe, the old servant, and gone home with Mrs. Wiggs, relieving as far as possible the immediate needs of the family. Then she had come home and written their story, telling it simply that 
but with the passionate earnestness of one who for the first time has come into contact with poverty and starvation. She told of the plucky struggle made by the boy, of his indomitable courage, and of his final defeat. She ended by asking help of any kind for the destitute family. A week later she sat at her desk bewildered, her article written on the impulse of the moment, with the one thought of making people understand, had fulfilled its mission. For seven days she had done nothing but answer questions and notes and receive contributions for the Whigs family. Money had arrived from all over the state and from every class of society. The Eckstein brothers sent fifty dollars and six ragged newsboys came to present thirty cents. Mrs. Van Larkston's coachman had to wait with her note while Lucy answered the questions of an old lame man who brought a quarter. Maria Dunn told me what was writ in de paper about that poor chillin, he was saying. I certainly do feel sorry for his ma. I ain't got much, but I just told Maria I guess we could do without something to give a quarter. So it continued, old and young, rich and poor, paid their substantial tri tribute of respect to Jimmy Wiggs. Lucy counted up the long line of figures, three hundred and sixty-five dollars, she exclaimed, food and clothes, coal enough to last them a year. It was like a direct answer to her prayer, and yet this poor little suppliant, instead of being duly exalted, put her head on the desk and wept bitterly. Now the needs of the Whigs family had been met. Another appeal, silent and potent, was troubling her heart. Redding had neither come nor written, and she was beginning to realize the seriousness of their misunderstanding. Chapter 4. The Annexation of Cubby They well deserve to have that know the strongest and surest way to go. Almost a year rolled over the cabbage patch, and it was nearing Christmas again. The void left in Mrs. Wiggs's heart by Jim's death could never be filled, but time was beginning to soften her grief, and the necessity for steady employment kept her from brooding over her trouble. It was still necessary to maintain the strictest economy, for half the money which had been given them was in Miss Alcott's keeping as a safeguard against another rainy day. Mrs. Wiggs had gotten as much washing as she could do. Asia helped about the house, and Billy did odd jobs wherever he could find them. The direct road to fortune, however, according to Billy's idea, could best be traveled in a kindling wagon, and while he was the proud professor of a dilapidated wagon, some relic of the late Mr. Wiggs, he had nothing to hitch it to. Scarcely a week passed that he did not agitate the question, and as Mrs. Wiggs often said, when Billy Wiggs done set his head to a thing, he's as good as got it. So she was not surprised when he rushed breathlessly into the kitchen one evening about supper time and exclaimed in excited tones, Ma, I got a horse. He was having a fit on the commons, and they was going to shoot him, and I asked the man to give him to me. My land, Billy, what do you want with a horse? asked his mother. Cause I know you could cure him. The man said if I took him, I'd have to pay for carting away his carcass. But I said all right, and I'll take him away. Come on, mount see him. And Billy hurried back to his new possession. Mrs. Wiggs pinned a shawl over her head and ran across the commons. A group of men stood around the writhing animal, but the late owner had departed. He's most gone, said one of the men as she came up. I told Billy you beat him for taking the old nag often the man's hands. Well, I won't, said Mrs. Wiggs stoutly. Billy Wiggs got more sense than most men I know and that horse's carcass is worth something. I spect he'd bring about two dollars dead and maybe more living. Anyway, I'm gonna save him if there's anything to save. She stood with her arms on her hips and critically surveyed her patient. I'll tell you what's the matter with him, was her final diagnosis. His lights is riz. Billy, 
I'm going home for some medicine. You said on his head, so's he can't get up, and Ma'll be right back in a minute. The crowd which had collected to see the horse shot began to disperse, for it was supper time, and there was nothing to see now but the big, poor, suffering animal, with Billy Wiggs patiently sitting on his head. When Mrs. Wiggs returned, she carried a bottle and what appeared to be a large marble. This here is a calomel pill, she explained. I just roll the calomel in with some soft, light bread. Now you pop open his jaw with a little stick and I'll shove it in. And then hold his head back until I pour down some water and turkin out in this bottle. It was with great difficulty that this was accomplished, for the old horse had evidently seen a vision of the happy hunting ground, and was loath to return to the sordid earth. His limbs were already stiffening in death, and only the whites of his eyes were visible. Mrs. Wiggs noted these discouraging symptoms, and saw the violent measures were necessary. "'Gather some sticks and build a fire quick as you can, and I've got to run over home. Build it right close to him, Billy. We've got to get him. Head up. She rushed into the kitchen and, taking several cakes of tallow from the shelf, threw them into a, t into a tin bucket. Then she hesitated for a moment. The kettle of soup for supper was steaming away on the stove. Mrs. Wiggs did not believe in sacrificing present need to future comfort. She threw in a liberal portion of pepper and seized the kettle in one hand and the bucket of tallow in the other, and staggered back to the bonfire. Now, Billy, she commanded, put this bucket of tallow down there in the hottest part of the fire. Look out! Don't tip it! There! Now you come here and help me pour this soup into the bottle. I'm going to get that old horse so heat up he'll think he's having a sunstroke. Seems shorter bad to keep on pestering him when he's so near gone, but this here soup will feel good when once it gets inside him. When the kettle was empty and the soup was distributed over Mrs. Wiggs and the patient, but a goodly amount had got inside and already the horse was losing his rigidity. Only once did Billy pause in his work and that was to ask Ma, what do you think I'd better name him? Giving names was one of Mrs. Wiggs' chief accomplishments, and usually required much thoughtful consideration. In this case, however, if there was to be a christening, it must be at once. I'd like a geographical name, suggested Billy, feeling that nothing was too good to bestow on his treasure. Mrs. Wiggs stood with the soup dripping from her hands and earnestly contemplated the horse. Babies, pigs, goats, and puppies had drawn largely on their supply of late, and geography names especially were scarce. Suddenly a thought struck her. I'll tell you what, Billy. We'll call him Cubby. That's a town I heard of um, talking about at the grocery. By this time the tallow was melted, and Mrs. Wiggs carried it over by the horse. She put each of his hooves into the hot liquid, while Billy rubbed the legs with all the strength of his young arms. That's right, she said. Now you run home and get the piece of carpet by my bed, and we'll kiver him up. I'm going to get them fence rails over yonder to keep the fire going. Through the long night they worked with their patient, and when the first glow of morning appeared in the east, a triumphant procession wandered its way across the cabbage patch. First came an old woman bearing a sundry pails, kettles, and bottles, and next came a very sleepy little boy leading a trembling old horse, with soup all over its head, tallow on its feet, and strips of rag carpet tied about its middle. And thus, Cuba, like his geographical namesake, emerged from the violent ordeal of re reconstruction with a mangled constitution, internal dissension, a decided preponderance of foreign element,
but a firm and abiding trust in the new power with which his fortunes had been irrevocably cast.